All right. So guys, do this with me. Grab that notes page that you have in front of you and let me lay this out for you so you understand really clearly how this is going to go down. So guys, you'll notice that that notes page, I'm glad you flipped it over. The notes page is only single sided. So guys, let me let me explain to you the way that this is going to go. So as I just mentioned to you, our goal for today is to tear the Bohr model apart. And so guys, there's actually a person that was responsible for destroying the Bohr model, and his name is Heisenberg. Probably a new name for you, um, but guys, when we get to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that's the point at which the Bohr model falls apart. Then guys, what you're gonna see is after the Bohr model got torn apart, an idea of probability saved it. And we're gonna talk about probability and a little bit about what that means. And then, guys, we're going to talk about the weaknesses of the Bohr model and the strengths of the model that replaced it, which is the Schrodinger model. So, guys, then you see where this turns into an outline? This is where this gets mind-boggling. So, guys, follow along on the paper and let me explain. Everything that we're going to talk about up here is going to be accessible. It's going to be interesting. You're going to be like, okay, I understand why the Bohr model doesn't work. I understand how Schrodinger's model's better. This is all gonna be really good for you. And then we're gonna go down here and this is gonna get really weird. So guys, here's the scoop. When you get down here to this bottom part and it gets weird, what you wanna do in response to that is take notes and then do the homework. And I promise you this, that if you can answer the homework questions that are based on this outline, you're exactly where you need to be. And then guys, what you're gonna find out is that trapped inside this outline is all of this stuff. This outline right here actually describes all of these really interesting things over here. <clears throat> and so what we're gonna do is on Monday, we're gonna lift all of these ideas out of the outline. It's a really interesting day. So guys, with this said, this is where we are and this is where we're going. And here's the deal, guys. If it's not on here, don't write it down, please. If it's not on here, don't write it down because a lot of this is conversational and we're gonna break out strobe lights and fans and start shooting stuff around the room. It gets to be a pretty good day. So guys, this then is the idea. Building up this idea of the Bohr model, again, don't write this down, but here's where we are. Today, guys, what we're going to do is tear the Bohr model apart. So we understand that it's not completely right. It's not completely wrong. There are pieces of it that are worth holding on to. But guys, it's not completely right. So today, we're only going to do this. We're going to rip the Bohr model apart, but we're not going to replace it. We're not going to talk at all about this. We're going to do that on Monday. So guys, these then become our goals for today. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> Went one too many. So guys, again, our goals for today go like this. Oops, it didn't go up. There we go. All right, so what we're going to try to do today, guys, is first of all, figure out why the Bohr model is not complete. You'll see in just a minute. <clears throat> then, guys, once we've torn the Bohr model apart, we are not going to replace it. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to gather together the parts that we do need to replace it, but we're not going to build the new model with those parts until next time. So guys, let's do this. Let's go back to the flame test lab and let's talk a little bit about this idea of the Bohr model. So guys, let's review. How did Bohr come up with his model? Well, the answer is he studied light from falling electrons. So guys, let's talk about this and let's build up the Bohr model. So here's what we're gonna do. This piece of paper represents an electron. My hand for now represents the nucleus. But guys, what is this electron? As far as Bohr knew, what is this electron doing in an atom? It's not holding still. What's it doing? Go ahead. Yeah, it's moving in circles, right? And we call this the planetary model. So planet and sun like nucleus and electrons. So guys, now let's talk about the terms. When this electron is in its lowest orbit, what do we call that lowest orbit? The ground state, right? So this electron is chilling. It's doing this in its ground state. And then all of a sudden, we can kick it up into a higher energy level, which we call what? Excited state. So guys, how do we do that? How do we take an electron from its ground state to an excited state? Add energy. What kind of energy? Doesn't matter. 
light, heat, radiation, electricity, doesn't matter. So guys, we add energy to this electron and now it's in an excited state, but it can't stay there. And when it falls back down, how does that energy come back out? In the form of light. Now guys, how, do, how did Bohr know, how do we know how far the electron fell? Different colors. So guys, if an electron goes through a short fall, that's low energy. What color? Red. And then if it goes through a long fall, that is higher energy and it'll be more violet or blue. Is all of that coming together for you? So guys, that's exactly what Bohr did. He studied this light from falling electrons. Sounds like you guys learned a lot from the previous lab. <clears throat> and so what he was doing is he's describing electrons like little particles moving around the nucleus. But guys, here's the problem. In order for this model to work, you've got to be able to locate and track electrons. So you've got to know it's in, an ex it's in a ground state, it's in an excited state, it's rising and it's falling. It literally treats electrons like little particles. But guys, as Bohr was doing this, what he was doing is, is he was building his model, he started to apply some math to it, and he used the variable n to describe the size of its orbit. So this is n equals 1, this is n equals 2, this is n equals 3, and he described an atom, as you know, like a solar system where these n values describe the size of the orbits. So guys, that's the Bohr model. Things there that you want to talk about, or can we tear it apart? Please. That's a brilliant question. Um, so, <laughs> you're, uh, 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 okay, so let's say this. They, they don't, uh, here's the problem. Electrons are not always particles. So, <laughs> electrons only, uh, okay, so electrons only exist when we look for them. I know it's really weird. There's a name for it. It's called the wave particle duality of nature. And so for most of an electron's life, it doesn't exist at all. And from having watched those videos that you watched before today, um, you may have picked up on this idea that electrons can actually travel from one position to another position without traveling through the space in between. So when we think of planets moving around the sun, we're like, if a planet's moving around the sun, it's got a velocity, right? Electrons don't. Um, electrons move in ways that are physically impossible in our world. So to say, do they travel at the same speed is even a question that we can't talk about because sometimes they're not even there and they magically pop into existence. Not good, right? Uh, So, yeah, we're certainly still working on this. But the, prob the problems that we're trying to solve right now are even greater than that. We're trying to figure out what they're made of, what holds them together, and how they interact with even smaller bits of matter. Most of this stuff is pretty well settled. There are tons of questions we're still looking at, but they're even deeper than what you're thinking. So, guys, are we good on the Bohr model of the atom? Does that sit okay? So... <clears throat> As you're listening to this idea that electrons maybe do or maybe don't exist, we're going to get into that when we start talking on Monday. For now, we're going to go with McKay's idea that they do have velocities, that they are always present, and that they're moving like little particles. You guys good on the idea? Okay, anything else you want to talk about with Bohr? All right. So guys, this then is where this gets a little bit crazy. And you'll notice that this is the next thing, the first thing in your notes. Now, guys, be ready to scratch this idea, this idea down, but I need, to, I need to lead you into this idea. So, guys, this is how this went. So, imagine the 1920s, and Bohr is studying electrons like little particles, and they're moving around the nucleus, and he adds energy, and they jump up, and they fall back down, and he's mapping all these rises and all these falls, and he's studying light, and he's drawing out these really neat solar system pictures of what atoms are doing, and everything's going great for a couple years. And then, guys, what happened is this. 
as Bohr got deeper and deeper into his research, what he found is that his data started to fall apart. And he was gathering all this light data and he was studying energy changes and mapping atoms. And guys, about the second year of this research, things just, it, it really got weird. And he's gathering all this data and it doesn't make sense. And he's like, okay, hold on. So what are these electrons really doing? And guys, Bohr came to crisis. His research started to fall apart and what he was working on wasn't working anymore. And so guys, like any good researcher, when your research starts to crumble, what's the very first thing you do? What do researchers do when their research starts to fall apart? What would you do if you were working... Grab that. What would you do if you were working on something and what you were working on starts to break? Start over. Yeah, save it. You're going to go back. You're going to check all of your instrumentation. You're going to try to save this thing. And that's what Bohr did. He called in a group of scientists. He tried to, he tried to save what he was doing, and it didn't work. All this data that he was gathering was the same after he, even after he tried to fix stuff. So guys, then what do scientists do? If you're a scientist and you're sure that your data is good and you can't make sense of it, what do you do next? You publish it. And guys, that's exactly what Bohr did. He took all of this data that was not making sense and he put it in a journal and he shared it with the entire world. And he went, hey world, guess what? I've got all this weird data and this is not making any sense at all. Can you help me make sense of it? And guys, one of the people that read his data was a guy named Werner Heisenberg. And guys, this is a really interesting idea. So Heisenberg read his data. Heisenberg, and this guy at the time was one of the brightest mathematicians on the planet. And guys, Heisenberg read Bohr's data and he was like, Bohr, here's the deal. He actually wrote him a letter. And he said, Bohr, the problem is this. The problem is not with your research. Your experiments are good. Your data is good. The problem is, is your understanding of electrons is wrong. And guys, this is what he said. Remember, if you're Bohr, you've got to be able to track electrons like little planets moving around the sun, rising and falling and excited and ground state and all this other stuff. And Heisenberg wrote to him and he said, Bohr, this isn't going to work. Not because your experiment is bad, but because our understanding of electrons is wrong. And this is what he said. And this is what you need to write down. So this is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So Heisenberg wrote to Bohr and he said this. He said, Bohr, here's the problem. The problem is, is that we can't know exactly where an electron is and where it's going. McKay, do you see the connection? Yeah, that very question that you ask about how fast are they going, Heisenberg would say that that's not even a question we can ask because we don't know where they are and we don't know where they're going. But guys, the thing that was reassuring to Bohr is that the problem was not with his experiments. Instead, guys, the problem is that there's something fundamentally unusual about electrons that don't allow them to be studied this way. Heisenberg actually said it like this. He said there are questions of electrons that we simply cannot ask. Kind of a deep thought. Oops, sorry, buddy. <clears throat> so guys, once you're done jotting down these ideas, let's make sure you're clear on this but let me babble into your ear as you do. So again, Bohr, studying electrons like little particles, exciting, falling, excited state, ground state, light coming out, mapping electron orbits, all this fascinating work that he's doing, and all of a sudden it gets weird. So Bohr publishes his data, and along comes Heisenberg, and Heisenberg says, your experiments aren't wrong. The problem is, is that electrons don't behave like little particles. You can't treat them like little particles because that's not the way that they actually behave. So instead of there being something wrong with his, his experiments, 
There's something fundamentally unusual about electrons that don't let us study them this way. The deeper we dig, the crazier it gets. So guys, you all settled there? Is that okay? All right, so guys, once we get to this point, and this is, you know, a couple of years later, and Heisenberg said, we can't study electrons like little particles. Guys, there was a crisis in the subatomic study world. They didn't know how to move on. They knew that Heisenberg was right. They knew that electrons were not like little particles, and they were completely stuck, completely stuck. Is it okay if I transition? Because guys, then along comes a dude named Schrodinger. And you see that word probability in your notes? Should be the next thing, right? Guys, listen carefully because this is really subtle. But this is how Schrodinger saved the day. And guys, this is where this gets really interesting. So here's the idea. Listen close. So here's the way this goes. Bohr is trying to study electrons like planets around the sun. Heisenberg comes along and says, uh-uh, you can't do that. You can't know where an electron is and where it's going because electrons don't behave that way. Now, guys, listen close. Here's what Schrodinger did. He came along and he said, fine. If we can't know where an electron is all the time, listen to the word, if we can't know where an electron is all the time, what if we simply talk about where an electron will probably be? See the connection? Where an electron will probably be most of the time. Do you see the difference? Bohr was like, we need to know where they are so we can watch them move around. Heisenberg said that's impossible. Schrodinger comes along and says, okay, if that's the game we've got to play, let's just figure out where they will probably be most of the time and he introduced the idea of probability guys probability is the ability to know where an electron will be most of the time so you're like wait a second how is that better well guys it completely revolutionized the study of of how electrons behave completely revolutionized it. And guys, it totally changed the way that we talk about electrons, the way that we understand electrons, because it allows us to account for the fact that electrons are not like little particles moving around the sun, that they are these radically different creatures that behave in very unusual ways. And so people came to Schrodinger and he said, okay, Schrodinger, then how do we understand electrons? If it's not orbits around the sun, how do we understand electrons? And Schrodinger said like this. Now, guys, you're done taking notes for a really long time, right? Do you see how the next thing we're going to do is the outline, right? So, guys, dig into this because this is really cool. So, but you're not writing stuff down. So here's the deal, guys. So Schrodinger comes along and he, they say, what does an atom look like? And they say it looks like this. So guys, let's talk about this. And I had to draw it in just for clarity. What's the heavy blue dot in the middle? The nucleus, right? So guys, what do the dots represent? Not electrons. But did you say singular or plural? It's singular. Guys, these dots represent one electron moving around the nucleus. Now you're like, wait a second, how does this work? Guys, this is actually, to understand this, this new way of thinking about electrons, this is like a time-lapse photo. And guys, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, let me explain it to you this way second let me get this dialed in okay so like that and we'll go like this okay so guys this is the idea what we're doing is we're trying to understand what this picture means so let me shut off the lights nope that's not it where's it at right here all right so guys this then is the idea this is the analogy imagine that my tabletop is a piece of photograph it's a piece of film okay and 
what we're going to do is we're going to shine light on that film. I'm going to slow this down a little bit. So we're going to shine light on this film. And so if I were to hold out my hand and let this go for a second, and then if I were to develop the film, you'd see the shadow of my hand, right, on the film. Well, guys, now let's talk about electrons. So here's the nucleus of the atom, and here then is an electron. And guys, this is the idea. This electron casts a shadow on the film. And so every time the light flashes, it exposes the film. And the idea is that then over time, we're going to see tracks from where this electron is. Now, guys, imagine this. Imagine that the Bohr model was correct and that an electron moved around the nucleus like a planet around the sun. Guys, if that's correct, and if we develop this film, what would the film look like? A circle. You got the idea? But guys, it turns out that that is not what electrons are doing. And maybe you picked up on some of this from the videos that you watched, but guys, this is the idea. What electrons are doing is crazy. They're moving randomly around the nucleus, and then they're here, and up it's gone, and now it's over here, and it's doing all this wacky, crazy crap and flying around and going here, and now it disappears, and then it's, and it's going, and it's booming, and it's zooming, and it's crazy. But guys, if we were to develop that piece of film, what would it look like? Like this, right? But you said something important. Guys, where are the dots more dense? Towards the nucleus. Why? Because the nucleus is positive and the electron is negative and there is an attraction. But guys, what do these dots represent? Well, they represent the places where these electrons will be. And what Schrodinger said is there is a region where we will most likely find this electron we call this the region of increased probability. And so he started drawing circles. But guys, understand that this is three-dimensional. So it's not a circle, it's a sphere. And he said there are places where we do find electrons, most likely, and there are places where we typically won't find electrons. And he started to talk about this idea of probability. Now, guys, here's the interesting follow-up question. What if I keep this going? What if I were to do this, and if I were to allow this electron to move around for like a day, and we just keep doing this, and it keeps exposing the film, and it goes on and on and on and on. Guys, if I were to allow this to continue, eventually what would this picture look like? A sphere. And guys, this is the way that we understand electrons in atoms. Guys, it's critical that you understand what you're looking at on the right. So guys, here's the deal. We understand electrons to behave like these big, solid spheres. Now guys, but what is it that allows this to behave like a big, solid sphere? Well, it's actually made up of a bunch of little dots. And these little dots represent where these electrons will be most of the time. But the electron is moving so quickly that it behaves as if it were a solid. But guys, understand if we could hit pause, what we would see is a dot. But because that electron is moving so rapidly, it behaves as if it's a big solid. And you're going, wait a second, hold on. You're now telling me that an electron is a point in space that behaves as if it's a big old solid simply because it's in random motion. Because that's exactly what I'm telling you. But I would also propose to you that it's not that weird of an idea. This typically goes horribly wrong, but let's see if we can do this. So guys, here's the idea. So what does this dangerously configured fan have to do with what we're talking about? Well, guys, what we're saying is this. We are saying that electrons behave as if they are large, solid spheres, but in fact, this large, solid sphere is made up of one electron moving rapidly and randomly around the nucleus, but because of that rapid, random movement, the electron behaves 
as if it is a large, solid object. Well, guys, I can actually show you that this idea is not as crazy as it sounds. I should have practiced. Typically, I don't do well with this the very first try. We'll see how this goes. All right. All right, Matt, I'm going to come join you. You ready? If I don't do well, I'm going to have you help me. So, guys, this is the idea. Let's relate this to what we're talking about. So, guys, this is going to be our atom. So, if this is our atom, what does that make this? The nucleus, what does that make the fan blades? The electrons. Now, guys, here's the trick. We are going to make these rubber bands. They could be radiation. doesn't matter. Something that can shoot through an atom. Now, guys, here... <laughs> Bear with me, this could go bad. So guys, what I want to do is I want to show you by shooting rubber bands through it that this atom actually has space in it. Oh, poop. Matt, I might need you, buddy. What if I get closer? That's cheating, but I got it. All right, so guys, we can see, yeah, that these electrons have space between, oh, that was good. These electrons have space between them, and as a result, these rubber bands can get through, right? But you see where this is headed, don't you? Because what happens when we set the electrons in motion? Is that high? There we go. Oh, a nice cooling breeze. So guys, here's the question. Do you see how that kind of looks like the picture on the right? Kind of like a blur, kind of like electrons moving randomly and quickly around the nucleus, although here they're not random. That would be cool to have a fan where the blades move randomly. Um, all right. The guy, how the idea is this. What happens when I shoot rubber bands at it? So if we shoot rubber bands at this now, you'll notice that the rubber bands can't get through. So as I'm shooting rubber band, oh, hit the nucleus. That's like Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Uh, so as I shoot rubber bands at this, guys, you'll notice that the rubber bands cannot get through. This thing is behaving as if it's a solid, but here's the question. Is there still space between the fan blades? Yeah, and you know what? I can actually show you the spaces. So guys, if I freeze the motion of the fan using a strobe light, you can clearly see that there's a space, that there are spaces between these fan blades, like right there. No, hold on. Isn't there a space right there? No, not a space there. But we can see the spaces. So guys, there are still spaces between these fan blades, but they don't behave that way because they're in motion. So guys, this idea that makes sense with a fan, that things that have space behave as solids because they're in motion, it works for fan blades and it also works for electrons. By the way, guys, do you know how this works? What's going on? How is it that this strobe light freezes the fan blades? You guys know? It's actually flashing at the same speed that the fan blades are spinning. So every time this light flashes, it actually illuminates the fan blades after they've gone through one rotation. So every time they're lit up, the fan blade is back at the same spot. So guys, for those of you that are music people, you might appreciate this. Let me go, actually here, I gotta go to a higher level. Ah, there we go, all right. So guys, here is one and two, and three, and let's see if I can get four. Come on, baby, four. Guys, those are harmonics. So now it's flashing four times as it comes around. So this is the primary harmonic, and then one, and two, and three. Was I able to get four? And ah, poop, I can't get four. But guys, kind of interesting, and it all relates back to this idea of harmonics and, and resonance, which you may have picked up on the video as well. But guys, the fundamental idea is this. These fan blades are behaving as if they're a solid, 
even though they're not. Do you get the idea? Things that, McKay, you were going to say something. Sorry. That's a great question. So the N1 and N2 stuff is back to the Bohr model, and it simply described the, well, hold on. Here's the thing that's cool. In Bohr's model, N1 and N2 describe the size of the orbit. What you're going to find out in just a minute is what Schrodinger figured out is that those n values weren't wrong, but instead of describing the size of the orbit, they were describing the size of the cloud. And that's where we're about to go. Yeah, London. Um, what does the represent? It doesn't. It's just a cool way to make the blades hold still. Yeah, I don't know. It's just me being nerdy. Sorry. All right. So, so guys, this then is where we are. Hopefully, we are all now comfortable with this idea that it's not so weird that things that have space in them behave as if they're solids simply because they're moving. And guys, this then is the idea behind the probability model of atoms. And you do want to scratch this idea down that's down below underneath where you have probability. So guys, it says this. The probability model treats electrons as if they occupy the whole space rather than simply being points on a path. And then, guys, one more thing to scratch down, and we're there. You're going to find out in a second that we give these spaces names. So guys, when we talk about these spaces, we call them electron clouds or orbitals. But guys, here's the thing that's really cool about this, a little bit of foreshadowing. These orbitals are so amazing. Let me show you why. Once you're done writing this down, let me show you why. It's funny, I still remember when I learned this in high school. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So guys, here's the trick. Not only are these orbitals more like clouds than they are like orbits. But guys, here's the thing that's crazy. Many times they aren't even spherical. Sometimes they are shaped like figure eights. Sometimes they're shaped like clover leaves. Sometimes they're shaped like flowers. Guys, that's what all of these things are. All of these pictures that you've been looking at on and off throughout the last few days are pictures of the orbitals that make up the electron structures of these atoms. It's crazy stuff. And we're going to get into it on Monday. All right. So, guys, let's review really quickly. Here we are. Ready? 30-second review. Bohr is studying electrons like planets moving around the sun, up, down, everything was good, and then it broke. Heisenberg came along and said, Bohr, not your fault. The problem isn't the experiment. The problem is that electrons don't behave like little particles moving around the nucleus. So then along comes Schrodinger and says, hey, if that's the deal, then let's think about these differently and let's talk about probability. And when we talk about probability, we talk about the places where electrons typically will be, but these electrons then behave like these big old solid shapes, even though they're not, and they're simply points moving very rapidly through space. You guys good on the ideas? Okay. Then guys, let's drive the nails into Bohr's coffin. Write these down with me. So now we've got some competing ideas. We've got the Bohr model of the atom. We've got the Schrodinger model of the atom. So why was Bohr's model incomplete and why is Schrodinger's model better? Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the answer is really actually bigger than you know. So what happened is this. So Bohr actually teamed up with Schrodinger. Bohr was like, oh yeah, you're, you're, and so Bohr and Schrodinger took these ideas and ran with them. And you may remember from that history thing we did, Schrodinger didn't do any experiments. He did math, right? So Bohr and Schrodinger became the original mathematical physicist. And they were like, hey, we can't do experiments. We're just going to do this with math. Einstein hated it. When this stuff first got proposed, it drove Einstein absolutely nuts. And Schrodinger and Bohr used to go to conferences, and they would almost get in fist fights with Einstein. Like it was, ga Einstein hated these guys' ideas after they teamed up and pushed this. And then it figured out, that it turned out that Einstein was wrong. Um, he, I mean, imagine proving Einstein wrong. But these guys, Einstein hated these ideas. And as they teamed up and developed it, I mean, and now, our world wouldn't exist without this idea of probability. It's how our phones work. It's how our everything around us works. It's unbelievable. You guys ready to go? So guys, let's talk about why the Bohr model's not good enough and why the Schrodinger model's better. So guys, in the Bohr model, you've got to treat electrons like particles. I guess we haven't directly touched on this, but how did Schrodinger come up with this idea that electrons are not particles? Well, the answer is he started to study them as waves. And we're not going to dig into this too much. It doesn't mean that electrons move like waves around the nucleus. But these shapes and spaces are actually described by the same equations that describe waves, <coughs> which is what brought these together. So guys, the Bohr model it turned out was a great starting point. It was simple, but it was a great starting point. The Schrodinger model is better because it's appropriately complex. So guys, what fundamentally is the difference? Well, the difference is this. The Bohr model was based on a solar system. Planets around the sun, like electrons around the nucleus. Guys, Schrodinger understood that a better way of thinking about structure is clouds. So guys, the difference is this. When you talk about a solar system, you're talking about an orbit. But in the Schrodinger model, you're talking about clouds. But what do we call those clouds that sounds a whole lot like orbit? They're orbitals. And guys, the fundamental difference is this, and this is what Heisenberg said. If you're going to study an electron like a particle in an orbit, you have to define a path. But Schrodinger came along and said, no, we're not going to talk about a path. We're going to talk about a probability. <clears throat> now, McKay, guess what we're about to talk about? Your very question. So guys, this then becomes the jumping off point into you filling out this outline. So guys, the deal is this. <clears throat> In the Bohr model of the atom, <clears throat> Bohr used n to describe the size of the orbit. Remember this picture? You don't need to draw it. But n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2. These are the orbits <clears throat> around the nucleus. Well, guys, what Schrodinger did is this. He capped n, which was size. But then he grew on that, and he included three other variables, L, M, and S. And guys, this is where we're going to pick up and finish up today. So let's pause for a second, and then we got about 10 more minutes left, and we're done. So guys, any questions about this progression of thought from Schrodinger, I'm sorry, from Bohr to Heisenberg to Schrodinger? We okay on the ideas? Are you all now convinced that the Bohr model is dead, and there's something better that can replace it? Is that okay? All right. So guys, here's the trick. 
We are not going to replace it today. We're not even going to talk about all these pretty pictures. What I am going to do is I'm going to give you the building blocks to build this idea. And guys, all of these building blocks are going to be down here in this outline. You are going to blindly figure, you're just going to blindly fill this in. But guys, here's the trick. This is going to be the foundation for your homework today. And as you work through this homework, what you're actually doing and you don't even know it is you're building this model. So when you come in here on Monday, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys grab your homework. And your homework is going to be sitting there in front of you along with this notes page. And guys, at that point, I'm going to give you another notes page. And once I have these in your hand, guys, Monday is a crazy experience because I'm going to teach you nothing. What I'm actually going to do is ask you a series of questions. And all the answers to those questions are going to be in this outline. And guys, as you answer these questions, which you're all going to be able to do, all of a sudden this stuff is going to leap off the page. It's a really, really cool day. So guys, what we've got to do to wrap up the day is we've got to fill out this outline. So guys, turn down, go down to the bottom of the page and fill in the blanks. Here we go. So guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these variables, N, L, M, and S. So N, notice, and guys, I'm filling in the blanks with you. I underlined them. Guys, this is the value that Bohr came up with. It's called the energy level quantum number, and it's abbreviated N. And guys, there are some things you need to know about N. Number one, just like Bohr said, it tells us the size of the energy level. Just fill in the blanks, y'all. Now, guys, on our periodic tables, n can only take on a small number of values. It actually ranges from 1 to 7. Then, guys, and we need to just talk about this. Did you learn in biology class that these rings hold two and then eight and then eight and then eight electrons? Completely wrong. Um, so, guys, let me explain to you how many electrons these can hold. This is what is called the 2n squared rule. So, guys, let me explain to you how this works. I'm going to ask you not to write this down, but I want to explain to you the way the 2n squared rule works. So guys, this is the idea. We know that n can go from 1 to 7, and so when we plug those numbers in for n, what we're going to do is we're going to square them, right, square, and then double them. So the way that this goes then is this. Just follow along. So guys, plug in 1 for n, and what do you get? 2, right? 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. Plug in 2 for n, and what do you get? 8. 2 squared is 4, double it is 8. Hey, so far biology is doing good, right? 2 and then 8. Well, guys, plug in 3 for n, and what do you get? 18. Biology lies. Guys, it does not go 28888. It goes 2818. What if we plug in 4? 4 squared is 16, double it is 32. What if we plug in 5? 5, 20, 50, um, plug in 6, 6 squared, 36, double 72. And then if we plug in 7, 7 squared, 49, double is 98. Guys, that's how many electrons these clouds can hold. It's not rings with 28888, it's 2818, 3250, and now it's not the rings, it's the clouds. So, then guys, finally this, as N increases, Three things go up. You already know that the size goes up. But guys, check this one out. So does the energy. 
That's the lab that you did last time. You were not kicking electrons between orbits. You were kicking electrons between orbitals. And those electrons were down here in a ground state orbital. And then you threw energy into them, and they went into an excited state orbital. And when they fell back down, they released that energy in the form of light. Then, guys, the other thing that increases is the capacity. And that's what the 2n squared rule is all about. It goes 2, 8, 18, 32, and so on. All right, this then, guys, is where this gets different. Because here's the thing. Everything that we just put on the board is what Bohr figured out. This is all Bohr model of the atom. But then along came Schrodinger and figured out it was more complicated than that. And he dug into the Bohr model deeper. And he started to talk about what are called sublevels. And he used a variable to represent them called L. Now, guys, in the same way that neighborhoods are broken into streets, energy levels are broken into sublevels. But there's a limit to the number of sublevels in an energy level. And, guys, this is mind boggling. Just write it down. The number of sublevels in an energy level is N. What the stink does that mean? Well, I'll explain it in a minute. But first of all, I need to give you the names. Guys, these sublevels are named S, P, D, and F. Sound familiar? If you watched the videos, you might remember this. Guys, this is why I had you watch these videos. I didn't expect you to learn anything, but I wanted to plant these seeds. Because here are the S and the P and the D and the F orbitals that make up these sublevels. But guys, let's go back to this and let's talk about what this means. What does it mean that the number of sublevels in an energy level is N? And what does it mean that their names are SPDF? Guys, follow my hands. Ready? First energy level can have one sublevel. It's an S. Second energy level, two sublevels, S and P. Third energy level, three sublevels. Want to guess what they are? S, P, and D. Fourth energy level, how many sublevels? Four, all of them, S, P, D, and F. Now, guys, we get into trouble. Fifth energy level, how many sublevels can it have? Five. And they are S, P, D, F. S. They say they're going to call it G. But guys, we have never created an element that needs a G sublevel. So here's what we do fifth energy level can have five sublevels S, P, D, F, and then we just stop counting. Sixth energy level, six sublevels. Seventh energy level, seven sublevels. Little confusing. Guys, when you see this come back together tomorrow or on Monday, it'll make more sense. And then, guys, please understand if you can do the homework, you're okay. Now, guys, let's dig in a little deeper. So, energy levels are broken into sublevels, sublevels are broken into orbitals. This is M. Two more minutes, guys, and we're done. So what is an orbital? Well, you already know. It's these cloud-like spaces. <clears throat> but the thing you don't know is there can be two electrons in each cloud. Electrons pair up in these clouds. But guys, why is that weird? And then we're done. Why is that weird that, in a, that a cloud can hold two electrons? Guys, what's the charge of electrons? Negative. And what do negative charges do to each other? They repel. They don't attract. So guys, you ready for this? This is really cool. Check this out. So let my fingers represent electrons. And in an orbital, two electrons pair up. And how can that be if they're both negative? You ready for the really cool answer? 
Guys, not only are electrons negative, they're also magnetic like the Earth. You know how the Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole? So do electrons. And here's what happens. Imagine that my fingers are pointing North Pole up and they're electrons. Guys, <laughs> this is hard to do. When two electrons come together, one of them flips over and they orient North Pole to South Pole, and that magnetic attraction overcomes the repulsion of their charge, and they can pair up. But guys, here's the thing that's crazy. We call this spin. This is where this gets hard. So guys, here's how this goes. Not only are electrons like planets in that they have a North Pole and a South Pole. Crap. They also spin. Electrons spin just like the Earth spins about their, about their axis, their, their pole. And so, guys, the electrons spin like this. But when one of them flips over, <laughs> how does this work? They, they spin now in opposite directions. They're, so when they flip over, one of their spins is in the opposite direction. <laughs> Crap, I'm so uncoordinated. Guys, they spin in opposite directions because one of them is north pole up and one of them is north pole down. So we call this the spin of the electron, but what spin actually represents is that they are their north poles are, are aligned oppositely. And the way that we know that they're aligned oppositely is we can actually detect the direction that they're spinning and we find out that they're spinning in opposite directions. So guys, when we talk about this, we call these spin up and spin down. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. Well, actually on Monday. So guys, there you have it. You're looking at all of this and you're going, oh my goodness, let's talk. If you understand Bohr, how Heisenberg tore it apart, and how Schrodinger in probability replaced it, those are the concepts you need to understand. Then guys, down here at the bottom with this information in this outline, also good stuff that, that you'll be processing. So guys, here's what you're going to do. Grab your homework packet. Grab your homework packet and go to assignment number three. So guys, this first question is all about Bohr, Heisenberg, and Schrodinger. The second question is all about what was going on with the fan. Then guys, starting on the third question, it starts to get into the stuff that's down in the outline. Here's what I'm going to have you do right now in the next 10 minutes. Guys, start on the third question. What does the energy level quantum number represent? What happens to an atom's electron cloud as n increases? Then, guys, on the next page. Hey. Oh, hey, how are you? Good, thank you. Oh, golly. So, um, guys, so start on question number three. In the next 10 minutes, you should get that question and the second page completely done. Then, guys, I don't know what your strategy is for this, but remember that we will um, get together on Monday. We will answer your questions about that. And then, guys, you will record those scores on Monday, right? It's locked now. I'll unlock it on Monday. And so, guys, for the weekend, what you need to do is finish this homework assignment, whatever you don't get done, and review your labs. So, guys, start on question number three. Go from there. And we'll go when the bell rings.